All right, let's pray. Father, once again, we are so grateful, so incredibly grateful to be able to come before you and actually address you as Father. And we know it's because of what took place on Resurrection Sunday that we can do that. And this morning, Father, as we come into your presence and seek your word and your wisdom and your challenge to our lives, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come deep inside of our hearts to heal, to bring joy, to bring wisdom, and to bring peace. We thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when I say the word Easter or Resurrection Sunday, or even Third Day, which is uh, a lot uh, of how people have been referring to this day, immediately things probably come to your mind. And if you are a believer, you might think about the empty tomb, the the visit of the angels, um, coming to church, fellowshipping, rejoicing, all the joy and and, uh, the excitement that's around that day and so forth. And if, and if you're not a believer, maybe that's, um, uh, that word brings about things like the Easter bunny or um, uh, egg hunts. Nothing wrong with those things. They can be a lot of fun. Uh, or it, it might bring about thoughts of, well, you know, maybe I ought to, ought to make my annual visit to church. Uh, or perhaps it's, why do you Christians keep talking about this Jesus thing? I'm just tired of it already. Just get over yourselves and let's just move on. Uh, but it seems like no matter what, when we say the words Easter, Resurrection Sunday, Third Day, it, it brings up thoughts, memories, maybe even emotions. And we read the accounts of what happened on that day and, and the glory of it all. And, and we picture a beautiful spring morning like it was earlier what happened. The clouds came out. It was, I mean, just this, earlier this morning, the sun was out. And you know, that's what you picture Resurrection Sunday should be like. You know, the, the, the spring is sprung. The birds are singing. The flowers are blooming around the tomb, you know, and all this. And that's what it ought to be like. And what I want to do this morning as we delve into God's word is I want to take all that away. Because the people that experienced this day for the very first time didn't have flowers blooming by the tomb, and they didn't have joy and anything. In fact, it started out on Easter morning as a very, very dark day. Even when the sun came out, the darkness didn't go away. And it was a day that was full of emotions that would be very foreign to us here in the 21st century celebrating Resurrection Sunday. And I want to kind of go back and look at those emotions a little bit. And not only the, the original emotions that, that the groups and the individuals who experienced Resurrection Sunday for the first time had, but the changes that took place in those emotions as, they, as it dawned on them what this day was really about. And for us, I, I want to kind of rediscover the resurrection and discover again those emotions and those feelings that we have as we... It dawns on us exactly what happened for us on that day. That's one of the reasons why I wanted us to take communion today and to really reflect upon the crucifixion because that held center stage in the minds of the people that we are going to read about here this morning. Center stage. That's all they could think about. And first, I want to look, if you turned with me to uh, John chapter 20, I want you to just uh, hold your place there, and I want you to turn back to Luke chapter 24. We're going to mostly be in John today, but we're going to go to a couple of other accounts as well as as we take a look at this. And in Luke 24, which is the resurrection account that Luke records we see that on the first day of the week, at dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. 
And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to all the rest. Now those that we're talking about here were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Now you are Peter and John. You are among the core of the disciples And this thing has happened, this horrible thing, where the man that you placed your entire trust in to save not only yourself in terms of you're now my Lord, but even your nation, and this man was cruelly taken away from you and you deserted him. He was nailed to a cross and he died and taken to a tomb. And now you yourself are afraid that his fate may now await you. I guarantee you that you would have strong emotions. Things would be out of control. And then, Sunday morning, some of the women come in with this fantastic tale of seeing angels. And what do you mean the tomb is empty? I don't understand this. And look at verse 11 here in Luke 24. These words seem to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Go back to John chapter 20 then. You can hardly blame their reaction, really. When the verse says the words idle tale are used, it it literally can mean um, something that's made up uh, by someone in a, a mental state of craziness. They'd gone mad. Maybe, maybe Peter and John thought, you know, it's just been too much. The grief and the stress and all that they have been through watching Jesus die on the cross has been overwhelming to their psyche and something has just snapped inside of them. And they wanted so bad for Jesus to be alive, they're making up this story or they're deluded somehow thinking that he actually isn't dead anymore. They thought it an idle tale. But something in what they said resonated with Peter and John. I don't know if maybe it was a curiosity check out this tale that they're telling, as fantastic as it was. Maybe it was a deep memory that they had of something, some hint of something that Jesus might have said. After all, he did tell his disciples at least three times that he was going to be arrested, tortured, killed, and rise on the third day. But you know, I I want to give credit to the disciples because if we had been there, we probably would have reacted a lot like they did. And we think, no, you know, if I'd been there, I would have gone, that's right, the crucifixion and then the resurrection and the angels and all that. Well, you know, this hadn't been written yet. It hadn't happened yet. You probably would have been every bit as confused as the disciples were with the sometimes somewhat dark sayings of Jesus Christ. And when he said, I'm going to be arrested and tortured and killed and rise from the dead on the third day, you you might have just chalked it up to, well, you know, that's another one of those things that he said that we just can't figure out. But something may have clicked in their minds. Oh, empty tomb. Hmm. So look at John chapter 20 in verse 3. This is the same story. We're just picking it up from, that, from the point after which the women came and told the disciples what had happened. So Peter went out with the other disciple. And if you know the book of John, that's how John uh, sometimes refers to himself or the disciple that Jesus loved. He doesn't really ever talk about himself by using his name, but it was John. 
Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. I, I love John. You know, he, he kind of puts in these little snippets here. Uh, both of them were running. So it was almost like Peter and John raced to the tomb and John won. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure the record was set straight on that. I got there first. <laughs> and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, (laughs) okay, John, we get it. You're a faster runner than Peter. Also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So, what happens here? An eyewitness brings an account to Peter and John that things are not as they were expected to be. Things were not as they had counted on them being. And so Peter and John race off to the tomb and confirm with their own eyes that something had happened. Now, it says here that they believed, but what was it that they believed? And we're going to read here in just a moment that when Jesus actually came and stood before them, they still didn't believe it. They still couldn't bring themselves to comprehend the fact that Jesus was actually alive. So what did they believe? They certainly believed in an empty tomb. Jesus was not there. But what happened? Grave robbers? It didn't match up. And John goes into great detail about how they found the materials that were used to wrap Jesus after he was taken down off the cross. And seeing them arranged in this way would not have been typical if a grave robber had come in and somehow managed to get to the body of Jesus and take it away. So that couldn't be it. But the problem with Peter and John at this moment was that they did not yet understand what God had spoken about what was to take place. That he had said many, many years beforehand through the prophets about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And it wasn't until when Jesus actually presented himself before the disciples, and we'll, we'll see that here in just a few minutes, that they began to understand. And how was it that they understood? What made the difference? It's when Jesus said to them and opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That's when their unbelief turned into true belief and true realization of what had happened. And so their kind of incredulity, which is basically you know, a word that means I don't believe what you're saying based on the evidence that I have. It's not credible to me. This kind of grief and incredulity turned into a belief in something and then finally into faith and belief that it really was real. And the key was an eyewitness account followed by an opening of the mind to the scriptures. So keep that in mind. Now let's move on in the account here in John chapter 20 and look at another person who experienced this day as well. And that was Mary, starting in verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head, and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they had laid him. Mary. Mary had given her all to Jesus. Jesus was everything for her. She she had given herself completely to him, and when he died... I think Mary died too, died along with him. She loved Jesus so much that even in death, she couldn't leave him. She comes to the tomb. 
She doesn't understand at all what has happened, what's taken place. And her grief is just clouding everything. You picture her tears streaming down her face, her eyes red and swollen. She probably can't even see straight. All she knows is she wants to cling to Jesus, dead or alive. She can't leave him. Now, at this point, Mary does not know all that Jesus has really done for her. So then, look at verse 14. So she is just, she's weeping uncontrollably. And she sees these these dazzling white men sitting on the place where Jesus had laid, and, and they ask her, why are you crying? And I'm sure that in her mind, she's going, What do you mean, why am I crying? You'd be crying too if everything that you ever loved, everything that you ever needed, everything that ever meant anything to you had been suddenly and forcefully taken away from me. You would feel the same way that I do. And she says, they've taken away my Lord. And I don't know where they took him. And having said this, she turned around. Now, maybe she heard something behind her, I don't know. She turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she didn't know that it was him. Now, why didn't she know that it was Jesus? A couple of possible reasons. One, as I mentioned, she was weeping uncontrollably. And you know what it's like if you are just crying like crazy and you can't stop the tears from flowing. You can't necessarily see straight. That might have been part of it. But we also know that Jesus, after he came back from the dead, was not necessarily instantly recognizable to others. Remember the, the story of the, the two men on the road to Emmaus? They're walking along, and up comes Jesus, the risen Lord. You know, you kind of expect him to come floating up or something. I don't know. But he comes up, and he says, hey, guys, what are we talking about? What's, uh, you know, what's the discussion of the day? And they're looking at him like, you crazy? Everybody's talking about this, this thing that happened, and you don't know, what, you know what's the matter with you. Don't you get the newspaper? And, and, and Jesus engages them in conversation, and they have no idea that it's him. And he opens up the scriptures and describes to them why the Christ had to die from the Old Testament. And wouldn't you like to have been a part of that Bible study? And then they finally get to where they're going and, and, and still they don't know that it's Jesus. And, they, and, and he's going to go on. He acted like he was just going to, okay guys, nice talking to you. Catch you later. And they go, no, 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 no. This is great. Come on in and share some more with us. And, and he breaks bread. And then suddenly... Either Jesus' appearance changed, the Holy Spirit opened up their minds so that they could comprehend who it was, or when they saw the bread being broken and and it just kind of all came together at once, they said, oh no, it's you. And then, boom, he was gone. And of course, they went rushing back into Jerusalem, adding to all of this mix, we saw the Lord, we saw the Lord. But so when Mary turns around, she doesn't recognize that it's Jesus. And Jesus talks to her and says, again, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, biggest case of mistaken identity in the history of planet Earth, (laughs) she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Wow. Now that's devotion. Mary herself, Mary is going to go and carry the body of a full-grown man who's been dead for several days? I don't think so. But that's not what she's thinking about. She's just thinking, Jesus, Jesus, I've got to find my Jesus. And so then Jesus talks to her again, and he just says one word, and it's all he needed to say. He said, Mary. And I don't know, again, whether it was that at that point his appearance changed, whether her mind was open so that she could see who it really was, or whether it was the way that he talked to her, saying her name in that way that only Jesus could. And she suddenly realized that it was him. And she turned and said to him, in, you know, so she's probably standing there and maybe she hears something. She kind of looking over her shoulder maybe, perhaps, you know, oh, 
you know, did you take him? I, I want you to tell me where he is and, I, and I'll go find him. And, you know, and so she's probably maybe f- continuing to focus on the tomb. I don't know. But then she hears that word, Mary. And then she turns all the way around, maybe takes a good long look at who was standing there. And she says in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then I'm sure at that point, uh, although it doesn't say here in the text, I'm sure she didn't just stand there. You know, we kind of picture the, you know, the Bible scene, you know, kind of a tableau. And she turns and says, Rabboni. And then Jesus says, you know, and they're kind of like this. I, <laughs> standing there woodenly saying their lines. I don't think that's probably how it was. You know, once she realized that it was indeed Jesus, this person that she had sought with everything that was within her, she probably just wham right into the guy. It was probably everything he could do to keep from falling over. Holding on to him, and, and, and Jesus says to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. And then Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. This is the first personal encounter that anyone had with the risen Lord Jesus. And what does he say? Don't cling to me. I think in one sense, Jesus was saying, you don't know yet what I have really done for you. Don't cling to this idea that you had of me, that I was just this earthly uh, rabboni, this teacher, this this, um, rabbi that you would give your devotion to. I am so much more than that. And your relationship with me is now so much more than that. There is a brand new life that has come to Mary Magdalene that day. And Jesus introduces her to this new life by saying, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. And he's saying that no longer, Mary, are you separated by your sins from a relationship with God and your ability to call him Father. So Mary has turned this incredible grief, this weeping, this inability to to comprehend and to go forward, now into this wonderful, incredible, overwhelming joy that Jesus is alive. And now he says to her, don't cling to me. I am ascending. There's a new day and a new life. Now I want you to go and be my witness. Well, not everyone received this news that Mary brought with great joy. One of my favorite Bible characters didn't necessarily react in the way we might have expected a disciple to react, and that's Thomas. (laughs) Thomas, in fact, was not even there when Jesus presented himself to the disciples the first time. Did he have a more pressing engagement You know, did he need to renew his driver's license or go to the dentist or something? I mean, why wasn't he there? Why was Thomas missing? I think that perhaps Thomas was filled with resignation, maybe even depression. I I think of Thomas that way partially because the very few times that we hear Thomas speak in the scriptures... It is, um, well, I'll give you one of, the, one of the examples. This is in John chapter 11. You don't have to turn there. But Jesus is saying, all right, we're going to go to Lazarus. You know, um, they, they brought news that, that uh, Lazarus was sick and then, and then later he was dead. And at that t- point in time, it was very dangerous to go near to Jerusalem because the authorities were after Jesus. And Jesus says, all right, we're going to go up and we're going to see Lazarus. And we know what happened with that story. He resuscitated Lazarus, brought him back from the dead. But at that point, the disciples are all thinking, we're going to go where? You do realize that we're walking right into a trap, don't you? And Thomas says, let us also go that we may die with him. (laughs) Words of faith. (laughs) Words of optimism. Yes, let's do it. Let's go and get murdered. (laughs) 
You know, it's this sarcastic kind of thing, and uh, it's 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 a fatalistic view of life that that Thomas has. It's it's kind of like a you know the heart of someone who's who's jaded, who sees everything around him with a with a painted with a black background on it. In fact, the next time that we hear from Thomas here in John chapter twenty, um, when when presented with the the reality of Jesus uh, uh, rising from the dead, he he says, "You know, I'm not going to believe until I can see the nail prints in his hand, until I can stick my hand into the side where the spear went in." It kind of as if to say, "You are going to have to give me such overwhelming, incredible proof that you'll never be able to do because I don't believe you." He was a skeptic. In fact, his name, and I hope my parents didn't. <laughs> Wait a minute. It, it, it means twin. And the idea, I think, there is that he was kind of of a twin mind. Part of him believed in Jesus, trusted in Jesus. But there was that other side of him, that skeptical part, that darker part, that kept him from really going all the way. He was a, he was a prove it to me kind of guy, uh, a guy that sees only what he believes and believes only what he sees. So look at verse 26 and find out what happened to Thomas. Eight days later. So here it's now a week and a day later. And his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, and I always kind of picture, you know, as, as Jesus turns to Thomas, you know, they all know what Thomas said, and all the disciples are like backing away from Thomas, you know. <laughs> Peace be with us, but look out, Tom, you are in big trouble. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Now at that point, something snaps in Thomas. You kind of figure that John would have recorded, and Thomas went right over to Jesus and put his finger in the nail holes and said, okay, looks good. (laughs) Pull up your shirt, Jesus. I'm going to put my hand in your side. Didn't happen. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That's a blessing to you, by the way, and to me. So Thomas, he turns from this incredible skeptic, a holdout, to the first one to declare to Jesus, you are Yahweh, you are my Lord, you are my God. And then from then on, in the last few accounts that we have in the Gospels, Thomas is not no longer absent. He's no longer off doing something else. Thomas is right there with the core group, fellowshipping and relating to Jesus Christ. What changed? What happened to Thomas? I think that partly seeing this incontrovertible evidence standing right before him broke through this, this kind of shell of disbelief. But, you know, I think in reality, Thomas's, Thomas's disbelief that he was holding up as this kind of wall was a lot thinner of a shell than maybe he really realized. I think that inside Thomas was somebody that always wanted to believe that it was true. The trouble is, is that you, if you look at the world from such a dark place like Thomas did, it's really hard to grab onto anything that's good, especially anything that's good for you. Because you think, you know, I don't deserve it. Why do I deserve this good thing to happen? And when he's standing there in front of Jesus, he finally realizes, you know what? I'm going to let this go. Jesus said, don't disbelieve. And then he declared his eternal allegiance to Jesus who had raised him from the dead. 
Another group who reacted to the resurrection in not necessarily such a positive way ends up with not such a positive outcome either. Turn back to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, starting in verse 11. Now this is what's kind of like, meanwhile back at the ranch, or in this case, meanwhile back at the tomb, the the women were going to declare the great news, and while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. By the way, if I were one of the soldiers guarding the tomb, I don't think I would really like that story. I would like, you know, an F-15 flew in, blew out the door of the tomb... A bunch of Republican guard came storming in and they subdued us with their advanced weaponry and uh, they took the body away and there was nothing we could do about it. But saying to the authorities, uh, we fell asleep on guard duty and a bunch of fishermen came along and, and while we were, we were tired, oh, we were so tired, we'd been working so hard, and, the, and we slept so soundly that, you know, they're pushing the several ton stone, rolling it uphill, and then, you know, they, that was really, did it really quietly, so quietly that we didn't wake up, and then, you know, then they went in and they, they dragged out the body of a full-grown male and, uh, and, and, and left. I don't think I would want that story told of me, and, and by the way, they executed guards who fell asleep while on guard duty. Not putting him in too great of a situation. But then the uh, chief priests say, and if this comes to the governor's ears, (laughs) thinking ahead, we will satisfy him. I think that probably means we'll pay him off and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day and even to this day. That story is still one of the ones that skeptics use to say Jesus didn't, he died, but he didn't come back from the dead. Because what they did is they went in and they took his body away, and what a great hoax. You could never prove that it, that it happened. They took him away, and they buried him somewhere. And one day, we'll discover his tomb, and, and, and you know, maybe they buried him with his family somewhere, and, and we'll discover a tomb that maybe has the, the names of some of his brothers and maybe his mom and dad, and Roger's chuckling over there because that's exactly what somebody did. They've claimed here even recently that, well, we discovered Jesus' tomb where his body lay with his family, and, and we can prove it, and we'll even do a National Geographic special or whatever it was, and, and we'll prove it to you. Not. But that's the story that they told. And it's still, they still try to tell that story even to this day. So the chief priests of Israel, they had so allowed the, the natural enticements of the flesh to permeate their souls that when the Messiah predicted by Daniel the prophet to arrive on the exact day when Jesus walked into Jerusalem, led them to say, this isn't the guy, and even if it is, we want to kill him. Instead of embracing him, they saw him as a, com- a-, a competitor. And it's because God wasn't really first in their hearts at all. They were first in their hearts. And they were really their own God. And they didn't want to let loose of the kingdom that they felt that they had. And they were long frustrated with Jesus. But they couldn't discredit him. They couldn't trip him up. They couldn't make him go away. And so finally, inspired, I'm sure, by Lucifer himself, they plotted a way to kill him. And of course, now this was God's ultimate plan, and he used the chief priests and their evil hearts and the evil in Lucifer to actually bring about his ultimate plan. And yes, God does use evil to bring about good. 
It doesn't mean he agrees with the evil. He doesn't mean it doesn't mean he made the evil. But who's greater? The evil chief priests, the evil in Lucifer, or God, the creator of the universe. So God uses the very evil plots that they came up with to bring about the most wonderful thing that has ever happened in all the history of humanity. And, he, and, they, and the chief priests think that they've succeeded. We did it! We got him! And, and you can really tell how evil they really are when at the crucifixion, instead of having this veneer of religiosity, yes... He was a threat to our nation and to our way of life, and we have done what justice and the law of Moses demanded that we must put him to death. You know, we are so pious and all this. No, no. They finally let it go. It's like this guy had been such a frustration to them that they acted like a bunch of playground bullies at the cross, and they're beating their chest, and they're chiding and ranting against Jesus at the cross, and they're really showing their arrogance fully. So then they go away, and, and unlike the disciples and, and, and Mary and the others, and filled with grief or, or depression or resignation or any of this kind of stuff, they're like, you know, strutting their stuff, you know. Hey, man, give me a high five. We did it. Whew, got that guy out of the way. This is awesome. All right, now what are we going to do? So then, Sunday, at some point during the day, yes. <clears throat> um, sir, we, we, um, um, well, you see, it's like this, um, you know, uh, we were like that, speak up, man, well, he's gone, sir, what do you mean he's gone, who's gone, what are you talking about, G- G- you know, G- Jesus, G- Jesus of Nazareth, what do you mean, Jesus of Nazareth, yeah, he's dead, what, one more, come on, speak up, he's not there anymore, well, yeah, we, t- you took him down off the cross, we saw you put him in the tomb, we, you know, what are you talking about, we're busy here, The tomb's empty, sir. What do you think their reaction would have been? I mean, I know the story they told. But what do you think was going on in those guys' minds when somebody said, and I probably, they told, you know, I I don't know if if they told them the the real story or if they were trying to cover themselves, you know, by saying an F-15 flew in or whatever, you know. But it's possible that they said, well, you know, We saw these guys, and they were dressed in white, and we were so afraid that we fainted dead away. And the next thing we know, when we open our eyes, is the stone that we rolled over the tomb and sealed with a Roman seal has been broken, and the tomb is empty. And you got to wonder if those chief priests were thinking, "Uh uh-oh. But did that stop them? No. Their hearts weren't filled with faith. They weren't hoping that it was the Messiah. They were counting that even if it was, it wouldn't matter because they got rid of him. So their response to the fact that Jesus had risen, even if they didn't believe it or not, was to really do more of what had already ruled their hearts. And that is that they created a lie and they used worldly wealth or money to bring about their ends. That's what they did when they brought about this plot against Jesus. They, they made up lies about him, and then they paid off some guy to rat him out and find a place where they could arrest him where the crowds wouldn't come against them. And so they did the same thing here. They create this lie, this false story about the, the re- resurrection of, of Jesus that they really didn't rise at all. They just stole him away, and they paid off anybody that would try to say anything different. And most of these, I wouldn't say all, but most of these ended up bringing about the very reality that they always wanted to be their own God. They wanted independence from Jesus. And that's what they got. An eternity spent apart from him and apart from the only source of good in the entire universe. In the end, you see, being your own God is a very lonely thing. So how do you feel when thinking about 
the crucifixion and the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. And these reports that he actually came back from the dead. You know, it's pretty easy for us to just surrender to fear, to reject the kind of eyewitness accounts of people who actually saw him and came and told other people, and those people passed it down, and it was written down, accounts that we still have with us today? Or can you maybe let that tiny bit of curiosity lead you to check it out? Now, we can't run to an empty tomb, but we can sure talk to other people who have experienced this risen Jesus Christ We can delve into what was written down by those eyewitnesses. And we can think, wow, could this possibly have been real? There's, a, there's an old saying about Jesus Christ that either he was a liar or a lunatic, or Lord. And those are the choices that we have. Was he a liar? Did he purposely bring about this plot? Okay, I'm going to raise myself up as the Messiah. And let's see, i got to think about how I can make it look like I die on the cross, and then, uh, you know, okay, they'll drug me with one of those paralyzing drugs that makes you think like you're dead, and I'll have, like, the emergency medical technicians on hand, and inside the tomb will actually be a little hospital room, you know, right off to the side there, and they'll, they'll bring me back, you know, with a shot, and eh, this will be great. Or maybe he's a lunatic. He thought he was the Messiah. He had a messianic complex. <laughs> but he wasn't really. Or maybe he is Lord. Maybe he is the real deal. If you're at all curious, check it out. These eyewitness accounts are among the best corroborated of anything we have from that period in history. No one has ever been able to present credible evidence to the contrary. Not within the scriptures themselves, which are the most accurate ancient uh, manuscript, uh, ancient writing that we have. You know, we think, you know, we read Plato and all these guys from that era, and we think, yeah, all that stuff came down to us, but that stuff's filled with mistakes, huge mistakes, missing parts, but not the Bible. And, and yeah, we can have discussions about different versions and is this word right or this word's wrong, but all of that is, is just like 1%. And none of it changes the reality of what was written down. And these people who wrote these eyewitness accounts, almost all of them, went to their deaths defending what they experienced. They said, you know, I can't deny the reality of what I saw. I'm sorry. You can do anything you want to me, but I saw it. It's real. Let curiosity take you to God's word. Check it out. Go into the tomb. It's empty, folks. Sometimes... It's not fear that keeps us away, but grief. Have you ever been in a situation where you just feel so bad about yourself and the mistakes that you've made in your life and your inability to do anything that's really good and really pleasing to keep you away from God? God does not want me. I'm too bad. I've done too many bad things i got to clean my life up, and then I'll come before him and present myself, and I say, well, now that's more like it. You know, I can take you the rest of the way, but you've shown a good faith effort here. <sighs> grief, but grief keeps us away. And I would encourage you, if that is what is keeping you away from, from the Lord, be like Mary. Mary was no saint, as we might say. I mean, she was a saint, but she'd done some pretty awful things too. 
And yet Mary brought herself to Jesus and wouldn't let go. And she had a personal encounter with him and this new life that he brought with him that turned incredible grief and mourning into wonderful joy and, 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 you know, I don't know, dancing or something, you know? Jesus rose, and her grief was no more. Maybe it's cynicism that keeps you away from Jesus Christ, this, this blackness in your life that shades out all light and all hope and all joy like Thomas. Easy to doubt, but actually, doubting and disbelief may be harder to maintain than you think. Because you know what? you got to actively keep God's love out of your life. In the book of the Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And anyone who would open the door and invite me in, I will come in and I will dine with them. And they with me. He is closer than you might think. And if in those really quiet moments, when you're not filling your life with everything else as a distraction, and you hear this, it's Jesus' love knocking at the door of your heart. He says, look, I know everything looks bad to you. I'm here to change that. I'm here to bring something good for you. Yeah, but I don't deserve it. True. I'm, I'm agreeing with you there. You don't deserve it. It's like, you know, it's like what I said. I don't deserve it. Yeah, you don't deserve it, but I'm giving it. You get it anyway. Why? Because I love you. Because I love you. Give way to that inner longing that's there that says, I really want to believe that this is true. I've been afraid to admit it, but I want you to be my Lord and my God. And then finally, sometimes it is easy for us to let the flesh force faith to flee. If instead of giving in to the risen Lord, we give in to the stubbornness of self-will, like the chief priests, we will find ourselves using every possible excuse that we can to avoid confronting the truth. And in the end, no matter what evidence is presented to you, the decision is up to you. Jesus knocks on the door, but he doesn't use a battering ram. He will never force his way into your life. You have to reach out, turn the knob, open the door, and say, all right, come in. We can either run away or we can run to him. And I would encourage you on this day, this Resurrection Sunday, to kind of let those, that range of emotion kind of wash over you. Feel what these people felt. We kind of take it for granted. We come at it from this end of the resurrection. We say, yeah, empty tomb. Isn't that great? And it is. It's wonderful. It's incredible. It's, the, it's the, the, the focal point of all of history, the empty tomb, because of the risen Lord. But come at it from the other side today. Think about, reflect upon what it took when it took these people and brought them, for the most part, from either uh, fear or grief or doubt into incredible joy. Because he has done the same thing for us as he did for them. He has given us that same gift that we too do not deserve. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that we can call you Father. And we can only do that because Jesus 
rose. And how much we rejoice over that today. And Lord, looking back at our lives, we're no better than the disciples. We're no better than Mary. We don't deserve that kind of gift that you bring. We didn't deserve for you to die in our place. And yet, Lord, we believe that it's true. We believe, Lord, because your scriptures say so. And we are so grateful for it. And right now, with all heads bowed and eyes closed, or maybe you're listening to or watching this some other time, some other place, the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ does not change. And there's a decision that you need to make. Faced with the reality, will you fight? Or will you make him your Lord? I would just ask that right now, if there's anyone that wants to give their life to this risen Savior, one who took all of the bad things that we have done, all the weaknesses, all the failures, he took them upon his shoulders, died, And felt upon himself the full judgment of the Father for all of those things that we have done that were wrong. And then because he had led a sinless life, he was able to be a sacrifice for those things, washing them away. His death provided us with life. If you can believe that today, if you can believe that this new relationship is possible for you because of the eyewitnesses that have brought us the information today, I would just encourage you right now just to to lift up your hand that you want to give your life to this one who is risen. And, and maybe, again, you're, you're listening to this or, or watching it some other time. I want you to just lift up your hand, too. If that is something that you want to do, you want to give your life to Jesus Christ. He's waiting. He's knocking at the door right now. He's wanting to know what your decision will be. Make the right decision. Don't go the way that the chief priests did in in using any means possible to stay away from Jesus Christ. No, turn as Mary did and run to him and cling to him and say, Lord, my Lord and my God, and bow before him. I guarantee you, you will never, ever, ever regret that decision. Lord, I thank you for those who have made a decision to know you and that you are now related to them. Give to them that new life, that forgiveness, and that wonderful relationship where they can call you Father. And Lord, today, make our steps a little bit lighter, our mood a little bit brighter, as we contemplate the incredible love that brought you to this earth and the incredible sacrifice that brought you into the tomb and then the incredible power that brought you back out again, power and life that is now ours forevermore. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you for it. And we do this in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Amen.